If you haven't heard of Everett Ferguson, you should have, and uh, you soon will, no doubt, as you progress in your education. Uh, certainly one of the foremost scholars in Churches of Christ over the past 50 years or more, and uh, written a number of things for uh, the Churches of Christ, and written quite a bit for a broader audience, scholarly audience as well. He has brought a couple of his books that might be of special interest, and he has a couple of copies to sell if you would be interested in that. Uh, Acapella Music in the Public Worship of the Church. This is now in its fourth edition, um, and uh, I read this when I was an undergraduate, and it's probably the best book that you will read on this particular subject, Arguing in Favor of Acapella Music in Worship. He has a couple of copies of this for $5. And uh, Women in the Church uh, is another book he has written, and I forget what you said, the, the price. Eight dollars, he has another couple of copies of this for eight dollars if you are interested in purchasing that. Uh, and we have him here, we brought him in for the Jack P. Lewis lectures, which, are, which will be held uh, today. He will be giving one lecture at 3.30. Periodizations of History in Early Christianity is the name of that lecture. And if you want to know what that means, come to the lecture. <laughs> and, uh, and then at 6.30, uh, his lecture is called Of Veils and Virgins. And again, if you want to know what that's about, come to the lecture at 6.30. Uh, we will also be having a dinner at 5 o'clock. Uh, and uh, you're welcome to stay for that as well. And at the dinner, there will be a few things going on, one of which is that... Um, Dr. Ferguson will uh, present a little bit of his own biography and we'll be able to ask him some questions on his role uh, in the church and in academics. So we're blessed to have him here in this chapel. Uh, he has agreed to just field a few questions and Brad will be emceeing that and asking him some questions about um, church history and academics in relation to what we are doing here, training in ministry to serve God's people. I'll turn it over to Brad now. Thank you, Dr. Ferguson, for being willing to uh, serve on this uh, one-person panel, uh, which is, uh, I think, ideal with somebody of your credentials and expertise in this area. And we thank you for being here, and we appreciate uh, your wife, Nancy, being uh, with us as well. And just kind of generally, um, if you could um, talk to us about how an understanding of early church history um, can help us understand the New Testament. Early Christian history and literature, I think, is very helpful for understanding the New Testament. Uh, most persons recognize that there is some value in looking at the backgrounds, the Greek, Roman, and Jewish worlds at the time of the coming of Jesus and the preaching of the apostles. This sets the context in uh, which the gospel message was uh, presented. But perhaps less well recognized is the value of the foreground of what comes after. There is a historical and cultural continuity here from the Hellenistic world uh, on to the Roman world and then the period in which the early church grew and uh, developed. I'll cite uh, two specific uh, examples of what helps us understand the New Testament with some clarity that we might not know if we did not pay attention to early Christian writings uh, after the New Testament. In uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 14, Paul makes a reference to how shall they say the amen to your giving of thanks if they do not understand what you have said. We might think of that as simply a rhetorical uh, statement. How can you agree to something if you don't understand it? But then on this point, the background and the foreground are both illuminating as to what Paul is referring to. In the Jewish synagogue, after prayer, and particularly words of praise to God, the whole community joined in saying a unison, Amen, 
and from early Christian writings, uh, such as Justin Martyr in the second century and other sources, we know that this was the Christian practice too, that after prayer, the congregation in unison said amen to the prayer. It was a way of ratifying the prayer, or in uh, colloquialism, it was a way of saying, them's my sentiments too. <laughs> <laughs> the leader of the prayer was not praying a private prayer. I think sometimes we make that mistake about our congregational assemblies, that someone is saying his own prayer and somehow we get to overhear his prayer. Uh, but that's not the function of the leader of prayer in a congregational assembly. He is voicing the prayers of the whole people and should word his prayer uh, because of that. And he's bringing a congregational uh, word to the Lord. And uh, the congregation affirms that it is their prayer too by saying the Amen. So from both the background and the foreground, we know that when Paul makes this statement, he's not speaking theoretically or rhetorically. He is referring to the actual practice in the assembly that the people would say amen. But he says you cannot say let it be so if you don't know what the person has said. This is part of his argument against uh, uninterpreted tongue speaking. Uh, in, in the assembly. So something we might just pass over and not pay attention to <coughs> takes on a richer and more specific meaning uh, when you understand this uh, larger context. And the early Christian writings point to the real meaning of what Paul is saying there. Uh, another passage that I like to use in illustrating this is John chapter 3 verse 5. Unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, there are a lot of efforts uh, these days to dehydrate the new birth. But uh, if you know early Christian literature, that simply will not work. Uh, this is the most commonly quoted baptismal text in the second century. The early church had no doubt but that Jesus was talking about baptism. A baptism in water in which the Spirit is at work. In the immersion in the water, uh, the Spirit is imparting the new life uh, to the uh, believer. And so it takes both water and Spirit to have Christian baptism. Because taking a bath or going for a swim isn't Christian baptism. There have to be some other things that go with it, and one of those things is the working of the Holy Spirit. But those who try to make this only a metaphor for what the Spirit does uh, have a completely unhistorical understanding of, of the text. And uh, early Christian literature, I think, here provides us with a very strong argument for the original meaning of, of that, uh, that passage. Well, the examples could be multiplied, but I thought maybe some specific examples would uh, give some support to my general contention of a broader value of uh, the study of early Christian history and literature. Thank you. Um, you really um, already touched on it some, but as you, uh, I'm sure, are aware, um, all the students here are trained uh, in ministry of some sort, uh, whether that be in the pulpit or missions. Um, are these kind of understandings of early church history helping someone understand the New Testament? Are, are there ways that these can be applied on the ground in real world ministry settings and churches? Well, as a historian, I'm prejudiced in favor of the study of history. <laughs> and I uh, think there is some value in knowing what has gone on in the past. And uh, in addition to elucidating the New Testament, these early Christian writings also show us paths of departure from apostolic teaching and, and practice. And 
that can alert us to trends that we might not recognize in the present. When you see something in another context, it often opens up your present uh, context. In addition to that, uh, there were a number of writings, particularly in the fourth century, getting a little further ahead in time, having to do with what the work and duties of bishops were. Now, the organizational structure there was different uh, from the New Testament, where there's a plurality of bishops, and not just one bishop. But the work of the single bishop has some parallels to the work of an elder, and also some overlap with the work of a preacher or an evangelist. And reading these uh, directions from authors like John Chrysostom, and Ambrose, and uh, Gregory of Nazianzus, and others, about how you carry on the role of leadership among God's people, have some deep and valuable spiritual insights uh, that can help a, a minister. In the graduate, one of the graduate courses I taught, I gave one of these uh, students the assignment of looking at these, and he was preaching for a local church at the time. And uh, for his uh, term paper, he wrote on these uh, readings about uh, how a pastor should carry on his work. And uh, that uh, was transformative for this particular preacher. He has valued it uh, very much because of what he learned uh, from that. Excellent. Can we transition to um, the early councils and what value did they have um, then and what value is there for understanding um, what they were doing uh, for us in present day. I suppose you have reference to the ecumenical councils that were defining the uh, creeds of the uh, churches. There were councils before that dealing with uh, other matters. Some of these early councils like Nicaea and uh, Chalcedon are authoritative for Catholic, Orthodox, and other uh, churches. They would not be for us. We are committed to the sole authority of Scripture as enshrining uh, apostolic teaching. Uh, but uh, these uh, councils are worth uh, knowing something about because they show the outcome of wrestling with the biblical teaching about the nature of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, about the nature of Christ, fully God and fully human. Uh, those are paradoxes, those are difficult matters uh, to look at rationally, but the scriptural evidence seems to point you in that direction. And uh, seeing these early debates and how they came out and how they were decided in the, in the councils, I think can help clarify the biblical uh, teaching for us. And I have a great deal of respect for the outcome of these doctrinal decisions. Although I do not believe the doctrines that they teach simply because a council affirmed them. Uh, they are like uh, the, the writings or the decisions of any individual uh, in the ancient or more recent times. Uh, they are worth following if they are right, if you can establish them scripturally, and they are to be ignored if you, you cannot uh, confirm them uh, scripturally. And these early councils themselves did not immediately and automatically have authority. Uh, the Council of Nicaea, which is uh, considered the first ecumenical council and is given a lot of authority in, uh, in many churches, did not win its way immediately. It was uh, for nearly a century after that that a lot of other councils were meeting and drawing up other competing uh, creedal uh, statements. So these 
councils had authority only in so far as what they said commended themselves to the great body of Christian believers, only in so far as they can be accepted uh, by the church in general. And I think that's true in any of our controversies today. Things are decided not because some preacher or some school or some paper takes a position, <coughs> but issues are decided as the people themselves decide that is the right way to go, or that that is a correct position. Now, the people may be wrong in our time as in ancient times, uh, but still in a practical sense, that's the way questions get uh, decided uh, in, the, in the religious setting. What is it that commends itself uh, to the understanding of a believing people? This may be too simplistic, and so forgive me, but um, can you explain to us, um, I guess, a basic um, patristic approach to biblical interpretation, and does that differ from how moderns and then obviously postmoderns look at the Bible, and what value does it have to know how they looked at Scripture? Yes, early Christian writers, and uh, they were not unique in this regard. It's true of Jewish and, uh, and pagan writers as well in interpreting important documents from the past. Uh, early Christian writers did not look at the scripture exactly the way that we do today because we are uh, the heirs of uh, modern scientific uh, uh, critical uh, scholarship. But uh, there were different approaches to scripture uh, in, the, in the early centuries. There was a concern with the literal meaning of the text, but uh, there was also what is uh, called an allegorical or a non-literal interpretation. The early writers generally referred to it as a spiritual understanding or a deeper sense of the scripture. And uh, sometimes this seems very far-fetched uh, to us, uh, what they do. But it was not uh, an unlimited reading into the text, whatever they wanted to. Because the reading of Scripture was always controlled by the overall message of the Bible. And it had to conform to what was understood to be the total biblical message. And uh, uh, this uh, served as a control on just an unlimited reading into it, whatever you wanted uh, it to mean. Uh, another approach was to see Old Testament events, and this particularly applies to the reading of the Old Testament, see it as a foreshadowing, or what is called the typological interpretation of things that were done by Jesus and by the, uh, the apostles. That God had an overall plan and purpose and things that happened in the Old Testament were anticipations or foreshadowings, pictures of what then is given a, a deeper, richer, fuller meaning uh, in, in the New Testament. So various approaches were, uh, were taken but all of these non-literal approaches, whether allegorical or typological, rested on the literal sense of the scripture. And even those who practiced an allegorical interpretation were not denying the historicity of the text of the Old Testament. Kind of a more general historiographical question. Um, if we understand history as analysis of change over time, in some sense, religion is changeless. Um, as a historian um, from a restoration background, um, how do we avoid kind of, you know, an unrealistic nostalgia for things in the past, um, but also um, <coughs> live out those restoration principles today? I might make a couple of observations here. History, by its nature, is the study of change. And uh, when things remain the same, 
you don't say anything about it. <laughs> it's a change that uh, attracts your uh, attention. And so as a historian, I have to pay attention to the changes. But there is a temptation there that you forget the continuities that occur in history. A lot of things remain the same. Uh, we talk about now living in the nuclear age after the uh, nuclear bomb uh, or in the atomic age, uh, discovery of atomic en energy and so forth. Or now more and more recently in an electronic age, means of communication. And so a lot of things have changed and that's what gets our attention. Uh, but the housewife still goes to the market on a certain day of the week to do her grocery shopping. And uh, what happens at the checkout counter may be a little bit different, but the practice continues the same. And so in a lot of other activities, there is a continuity. And I think we have to remember those continuities uh, in history and not just pay attention to what jumps out at us as uh, being different. Uh, now, in regard to the aspect of your question about uh, the restoration approach and uh, the ease with which we can uh, romanticize, say, the first century uh, church, uh, here I think we have to remember that the restoration plea, although it is often stated in terms of restoring uh, the first century church, what we really mean is restoring the apostolic teaching about the church. I don't know of anyone today who really wants to be the church at Corinth. <laughs> uh, but we are very interested in what Paul told the church at Corinth ought to be the case. And so we may ought to be a little bit more careful about how we word what we mean. We are interested in following the apostolic doctrine, the apostolic teaching about uh, the church. And the first century church, as a historical entity, had its problems. We today have our problems. And in the intervening centuries, the believers have had their problems. And the norm for us is not the historical development that's the norm for Catholic, Orthodox, some Anglican uh, churches. The norm for us is not the historical development, but the doctrine that uh, these churches in the different times were trying to uh, adapt to their situation. And we have to make uh, our practical adaptations today. And there's always a danger of confusing uh, the message which is unchanging uh, with the situation and how you apply it uh, to a given situation. And I don't have any special wisdom to give you any guidance on how to go about doing that. Uh, I used to tell my students when I was teaching a course in the Church of Christ, I'll tell you what the biblical teaching is. What you do with it is going to have to be up to you. And. Uh, Unfortunately, that's, that's the case, and we as human beings make our mistakes in that, but our human mistakes do not invalidate the, uh, the message itself that we're trying to follow. Thank you so much. Well, we're out of time, but I want to uh, say thank you again publicly for uh, being here with us today and to your wife, Nancy, and uh, really, it was just a wonderful uh, session, and we thank you for your insight and expertise and sharing with us, very practical and helpful. I found it fascinating, and uh, I know everyone else did too.